Hello and welcome to Going Strong, the radio show that celebrates Newfoundland and Labrador's vibrant culture and explores the traditions and people that make our culture unique in the world. My name is Deborah Collins and each week I have the pleasure of chatting with someone who has made and continues to make a valuable contribution to this place we call home. Today I'm especially delighted to speak with a woman who has spent most of her life honoring our music and stories and ensuring they will not be forgotten. She's a singer, a storyteller, a teacher, and a folklorist, all of which ideally place her in a position to share our stories and impress their value on all who hear them. And she shows no signs of stopping anytime soon. Anita Best, it's good to have you here. Well, it's great to be here, Debbie. I'm really happy to be on VOWR. Well, we're happy to have you. And and you're about to launch a new album of both songs and stories, and we're going to find out more about that shortly. But I'm curious about your love of stories, whether spoken or sung. You were born on Marachin in Placentia Bay. Was that a place known for these traditions? Well, yes, it was a place that was full of storytellers of all kinds. I remember in particular Mrs. Brad Fulford, she was a great storyteller. And Mr. Mick Casey, he was a great storyteller. And my parents, uh, both my parents, my mother came from Tax Beach, further down the bay. She was a fine singer, and my father and his brothers were great singers. So so you were born into it. I was yeah. born into it. <laughs> Hard to avoid it, really. <laughs> <laughs> and did you gravitate yourself towards singing and storytelling early on? Well, I was, uh, in my teenage years, I liked rock and roll and, uh, you know, country music, the mm-hmm. same as everybody. But uh, I got really interested in it when I was, uh, you know, when I started at university, I think. I got really interested in the folk rock tradition. And I met people like Neil Murray and Noel Dean and mm-hmm. Biggie Duff, Sandy yeah. Morris and yeah. people like that. I became really interested in uh, folklore when I married in the 70s and went out yeah. to Southeast Bight again. Is that right? Yeah. Southeast Bight in Placentia Bay. And I got married in the 77. And uh, my husband was Pius Power. And mm. his father was Pius Power Sr. Yes, of course. And uh, he was a renowned storyteller. And both of them were great singers and Oh, well, so it was all around you. It was all around me. (laughs) (laughs) I've always felt that there's something in either the DNA or our history that makes us natural entertainers, that a a disproportionate number of people from this place can take a stage and hold an audience in the palm of their hand. Not just actual storytellers and singers, but comedians, teachers, preachers, politicians, you know, whatever the platform. Newfoundlanders and Labradorians up the ante when it comes to natural storytelling and holding an audience. Am I off base? I mean, no, I think we have a love of language and we love to converse and talk. I mean, talking and telling stories is a kind of uh, sport, you know. It's a way of life. I, I, I think you're right. I think Newfoundlanders probably have a little bit more of it. Although some of us are shy. I'm, I'm actually a very quiet and shy person. Is that right? Believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we're glad you overcame that (laughs) to take the stages that you have. I remember asking you a question when I interviewed you years ago and saying, you know, a similar question, like, is there something about us that makes us natural performers? And you answered very succinctly. You said, hundreds of years of practice. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. I mean, we entertained ourselves. You know, when people got together and visited one another, they were responsible for their own entertainment. I grew up in a place without electricity. I mean, that was in my childhood years. Mm -hmm. And uh, you couldn't turn on a radio. You couldn't. I mean, there were wind up gramophones and so on. But radio batteries were very expensive. And so when people got together, they uh, they created their own entertainment. And I mean, clinging to a rock and the edge of the North Atlantic like we did. I mean, if you didn't entertain yourselves a couple hundred years ago, who was going to do it? Yeah, well, it's the same thing. If you couldn't um, build your own boat, Mm -hmm. who was going to build it for you, you know? You got used to being uh, self-resourceful. That's right. Yeah, Yeah, resilient. And one of those resources was the ability to to tell a story, you know, whether sung or or spoken. Or remember a story. I mean, it was largely an oral tradition. Yes, 
Yeah, my father-in-law and uh, when I married and went to Southeast Bight, that was in the 70s. And they, the oral tradition was still really, really strong out there. Of course. You know, it wasn't a literary tradition. But people mistakenly think that uh, people who can't read or write must not be very intelligent. That's not the case. No. You're using a different part of your brain. And that ability to memorize and recite is extraordinary. The memories of these people. They could go into the post office in the evenings, read the news, come back and tell it. And many of us can't do that now. And we rely so much on our devices Absolutely. And, and our books. And yes. we can look things up if we can't remember at a, them. At a moment's note. Yeah, in a yeah. moment. But those people, they remembered everything because they had to. We really are a nation of storytellers, I think. What, in your opinion, makes a story stand out, take its place in the canon of stories that are recorded and, and remembered? Well, I don't know. I think it has to grab you. Uh, you have to be interested in it. And uh, you have to be sort of on the same wavelength as the storyteller when you're listening to a story, you know. We're going to find out about your latest project, uh, an album of songs and stories called The Tin Table. And I believe you collaborated uh, with Pamela Morgan on that, your longtime musical partner. Pamela Morgan and Chris Brooks. Chris uh, actually produced the stories. And how we did it was I had a little studio set up in my home in uh, North Point. And I would tell the story to an imaginary audience, and I'd send the files to Chris, and he would do his magic with them. For the uh, ballads, it's a CD, three CD set. Two of the CDs are stories, because some of the stories are very long, 25 minutes or whatever. Eleven, I think, ballads that are unaccompanied, which is the old way of many uh, singers around the Bay didn't accompanied themselves, you know, yeah. and the ones who did, you played the accordion or something and accompanied themselves. But a lot of the singers, I come from a completely unaccompanied singing tradition. Mm-hmm. My mother sang unaccompanied, my father and his brothers, they all sang unaccompanied. And, and the focus was on the story. On, on what a you focus were. on the story. Yeah. Yeah. You, you sang a song to tell a story. Pretty special to have worked with Chris Brooks, I would think. Well, Chris was amazing. In fact, we finished the project on Good Friday, and he died on Easter Monday. It was the last project he did. So this is pretty poignant, pretty special. Oh, it is for me. I'm, yeah. you know, just uh, I can't even imagine that that happened. Yes. <laughs> and we're going to launch it down the Battery Cafe, which is close to where he lived. Yes, of course. He lived well, in the that's, Outer Battery. That's very appropriate. And of course, Pamela, you're a longtime musical partner. And you know. Pamela has the best ear in the business, I've always said. You know, she's just a terrific producer. And it seems fitting then, before we talk a little bit more about this album launch, that we hear a song from you and Pamela. Uh, here is Anita Best, Pamela Morgan, with The Lassie and the Land. As I rode down on a bright May morning To view the flowers and meadows gay Who should I spy but my own true love As she sat under a willow tree I took off my cap and I did salute her I did salute her most courteously When she turned around while the tears spilled from her She said false young man you have deluded me A diamond ring I own you gave me A diamond But the vows you made 
love you when done broke them And you marry the lassie that had the land If I marry the lassie that had the land, my love Is that I'll rue until the day I die When misfortune falls, no man may shun it I was blindfolded, I'll near deny I go to my bed of slumber The thoughts of my true love run in my mind When I turn around to embrace my darling Instead of going Shirt is brass I find And I wish the Queen would call home her armies From the West Indies, America and Spain And every man to his own true In the hopes that you and I might meet again And that was The Lassie and the Land by Anita Best and Pamela Morgan. And Anita is my guest today on Going Strong. Tell me about that song. Where did that come from? I got that from Tom Antle, who lives in uh, Fox Cove in Mortier Bay, out, okay. out around the, on the Beer Peninsula. He was uh, on the Grand Banks as a young man in a fishing schooner. And his dory mate was an Irishman, okay. an old Irishman, he told me. And he uh, got that song from this old Irishman. It's an Irish song. And it's been, you know, recorded by many Irish musicians, but I got it from Tom, and he was a a weathered old fisherman, you know, big hands, Mm -hmm. you know. You can't imagine that uh, a man like that would sing such a delicate song as this. And he had some really great songs. Oh, fantastic. He was a great singer. Tom Antle from Fox Cove. Tom Antle from Fox Cove. Let's talk about the new album, The Tin Table. What will we hear on the album? Oh, you'll hear two CDs of stories that I got from my father-in-law, Pius Power Sr. They're all folk tales and jack tales in some cases. And one is called Johnson and the Fellow Traveler. And uh, yeah, there are stories that I learned from him uh, when I went out there in 77. I realized he he told all these stories. He remembered them. Some of them he got from his mother's family, the Mm -hmm. Brewers. Mm -hmm. And some he got from, uh, you know, his own father and grandfather. Then there are 11 ballads that I got from various places. Some of them are French ones that I got from uh, various places like Quebec and uh, the west coast of Newfoundland. You often sing in French, and we're going to hear that a little yeah, bit later. Yeah, yeah I was songs. a French teacher for a number of years and taught high school French here in the city and out in Cornerbrook and various other places, Salmonier. A lot of our traditional stories and songs were brought from England and Ireland and France, you know, from our ancestors. What portion, or is it possible to even say, are reflective of the history and geography of this place? Well, um, Geraldus Doyle put out a number of songbooks, I think, starting way back in the... I'm not sure when the first one came out, maybe 1940, I can't remember. But uh, he concentrated on collecting the, the songs that were made up here that were about Newfoundland and they were, you know, local songs that were composed by people like Peter Leonard, who uh, came from Isle of Allen and Presentia Bay. Yes. Uh, he he uh, created a lot of great songs. He himself couldn't read or write, 
But he'd make up a song about an event. He liked to make fun of people, you know, and the comical songs. And then he'd sing it and somebody would learn it and sing it. And the boys would go in the lumber camps and they'd, you know, be passing the time away in the evenings after they finished their work and they'd sing the songs. And that's how it passed into the oral tradition and continued. And I guess, you know, songs that are being composed today might end up in the oral tradition. I'm sure some of Ron Hines' songs will stay and uh, and be passed along by singers. Already there's, you know, singers singing his songs. Exactly. And it's important to not only to hold on to the ones that were brought over from other countries, because they're part of our past as well, mm-hmm. but, but our own, yeah. Was there a point in time when our traditional songs and stories were in jeopardy? They're always in jeopardy, Deborah, because the overpowering influence of our neighbors to the south, you know, their culture sort of takes over our iPhones, our iPads, our computers, our radios, our televisions. Yet at the same time, there are young people like Matthew Byrne and Mallory Johnson and Mm -hmm. all kinds of people uh, who every generation, they go back to the music that they heard from their parents and their grandparents and so on. And they bring it into their generation. And that's what tradition is all about, bringing uh, the music that you heard as a kid yeah. into your generation. That's what Figgy Duff did. Uh, you know, when I was uh, working with Figgy Duff, I was one of the, I was the first singer with Figgy Duff. And then Pamela joined after me. And, mm-hmm. you know. As you say, each generation has its tradition bearers. And I mean, you travel the province collecting traditional songs from anybody who'd sing them for you. And, yeah, and yeah. songs so did, that. So did Pamela. Yes. And, you know, that's right. That was what we were doing at the time. Genevieve Lear. Yes. Yeah, we yeah. published a book together. Yes, was that Come and I Will Sing You? Come and I Will Sing You, yeah. Yes, a Newfoundland yeah. songbook. Why did you feel compelled to do that? I just wanted to have a record of these things. Like, uh, if somebody doesn't take note of them, either learn them and sing them, which is what I did with the songs, or write them down or record them in some way, then, you know, they're sort of little jewels that are lost. Yeah. You have a master's degree in folklore as well. Did the establishment of the folklore department at Memorial University, do you think, represent a concerted and official effort to make sure that these things weren't lost? Yeah, when uh, Dr. Halpert came, he uh, used to send his students out to collect the stories from their own communities, Mm -hmm. from their own people and so on. Some of them filled out survey cards, you know, with just one item of folklore on them. Some of them wrote papers. Some of them collected songs like Jesse Fudge, from down around uh, the South Coast. He collected a bunch of songs that eventually got turned into a CD Mm -hmm. from the uh, music school and the MMAP, the the Center for Music, um, something MMAP. I can't remember what the acronym stands for now. And place. Uh, Yeah, so a lot of these things that were collected uh, get turned into uh, CDs and music that are accessible to anybody who exactly. wants them, yeah. you know. They yeah. have been preserved, yeah. Yeah, in the Folklore Mon, Mon Folklore Language Archive and the uh, MMAP yes. Center of the Music School. And a lot of contemporary musicians are still using, like Bartok did in his day, and uh, lots of other classical musicians, they use the, the folk music of their country. Well, the musicians of today and uh, today's music students are using you know, Newfoundland traditional yes. music. And, yes, incorporating and, into, and yeah. incorporating the, that into their own yeah. creations, you know. Our time is moving really quickly. I do have a couple more questions, but first I think our listeners would love to hear another song from you and another of your longtime musical partners, guitarist Sandy Morris. You've made a lot of music over the years. Uh, what's the song we're about to hear now? It's Vive la Rose, which I got from Emile Benoit, who's mm-hmm. a well-known fiddler on the, and also singer and storyteller an amazing storyteller in his own language. And, uh, yeah, he lived over in Black Duck Brook, Lanso, Lanso Canal, yes, on the right. West Coast. Exactly. On the board board. Well, let's hear uh, Vive la Rose. Mon ami me délaisse Oh, okay, oh, vive la rose Ami me délaisse Oh, okay, oh, vive la rose Je ne sais pas pourquoi Vive la rose et le lila C'est pas s'il reviendra Vive la rose et le lila 
on dit qu'il a une autre Au gué, au vive la rose On dit qu'il a une autre Au gué, au vive la rose Peut-être plus belle que moi Vive la rose et le lila Peut-être plus belle que moi On dit qu'elle est très riche Au gué et au vive la rose On dit qu'elle est très riche Au gué et au vive la rose Peut-être plus riche que moi Vive la rose et le lila Sans doute plus riche que moi Vive la rose et le lila On dit qu'elle est malade Au gué et au vive la rose On dit qu'elle est malade Au gué et au vive la rose Peut-être elle en mourra Vive la rose et le lila Peut-être elle en mourra Vive la rose et le lila That was Viva La Rose with Anita Best, accompanied by Sandy Morris. Anita is my guest today, traditional Newfoundland singer, storyteller, and folklorist. Your passion and commitment to our culture has not gone unnoticed, first and foremost by your audiences, your fellow Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, but also officially with the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Newfoundland Labrador Folk Arts Society in 2015 and the Order of Canada in 2011. The citation from the Order in Canada reads in part, Anita has been active in collecting and performing the songs of her ancestors, ensuring this priceless cultural legacy is not lost to future generations. Do you think of it as priceless? I do, yeah, Yeah. I do. It's common, everyday, ordinary, but it is priceless because it belongs to us. It's ours. It uh, helps to define who we are. You know, there's songs that came down from our ancestors and were changed by them and altered by them and you know like Vive la Rose you know that uh, Emile probably got that song from a Belgian folklorist who was visiting here and then he made it his own yes and you made it your own (laughs) yeah and that's what happens you know when uh, the songs then they take on the flavor of the place and the people that live in that place you know and they're what they contribute to it and their understanding of it you know All that's really priceless as far as I'm concerned. 
We often think and say and boast, and I'm as guilty of it more so than maybe than, than most. I think we do have a really incredible culture, a very special, a unique culture. Do we just think we're special, or are we really special? I, well, I think every every culture is special to itself and to its adherents, you know. I'm sure the Jamaicans feel that they have a great mm-hmm. culture. Quebec feels that it has a unique and, unique and distinct culture in yeah. Canada, you yeah. know. And ours, of course, is, is such an amalgamation of so many folklore traditions. Yeah, it's very similar to Quebec in a way, you mm-hmm. know, like the, there was a, a Catholic church influence of and an Irish influence, a Scottish influence, and a very strong English influence. Mm -hmm. And that band that we had together, Sandy and Baxter Worm and I, Whistles Hope, uh, that Kelly Russell, uh, you know, formed, that was celebrating our English heritage, you know, because a lot of Newfoundlanders, because of the predominance of the Irish culture, a lot of people in Canada think of Newfoundland (coughs) music as Irish music, that they're synonymous of. It's not really. Newfoundland folk music is distinct. It has the flavors of all these other countries, but it's not like the Irish. Our tunes are not like the Irish entirely. They're not mirror, you know. There's something that's uniquely ours. We borrow from the others. We've contributed to make a a difference, you know. Make it around. And and the rhythms and the the various Mm. way the, the tunes go and the dances they were played for. A lot of, uh, one, some folklorists once said, our tunes are played by Irish musicians for English dancers, you know? <laughs> yeah. Or maybe the other way around, you know? <laughs> but there's a combination of all yeah, of that. There's a beautiful yeah. blend. And then because we were bringing fish down to the Caribbean, some people hear a slight Caribbean influence That's in right. those tunes from Newfoundland as well. That's right. Yeah. Well, we're rapidly running out of time. I do have one more question. I ask it of all my guests. I'm particularly interested in hearing from you about this. What keeps Anita Best going so strong? Oh, (laughs) what else are you going to (laughs) do? I sing uh, to, you know, please myself, and uh, hopefully other people will enjoy it as well. And I just, uh, yeah, I'm going to go till I, uh, I can't sing anymore. You've made a lot of people happy just by saying that. <laughs> oh, that's very kind of you, Debbie. <laughs> and, and all the best with the new album. <laughs> Thank yeah. you very much. All right. And thanks for being here. It's been terrific to chat with you again. Well, it's been lovely to meet you again. And thanks for all you've done, continue to do to keep our culture strong and vibrant, and of course for sharing your thoughts today. This has been Going Strong for this week. My name is Deborah Collins, inviting you to join us again next Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. right here on VOWR.